Good morning, grace and peace to you. Welcome to Grimsby Baptist Church this Lord's Day. Uh, wherever you are in the world and whenever you are watching this, we welcome you and we would invite you to come and join us in worship, in prayer and in sitting under the authority of the word of the Lord. To start with, we have a couple of notices that I just want to make you aware of. Firstly, the worship group have started on Wednesdays to release a video called Wednesday Worship. This will be a chance for you at home just to listen to the songs that we regularly play in church, to have a time of worship with the music and songs that we know, and a chance just to praise the Lord from home. It's a little different to just listening to a back and track. It's live and the worship team have done a really wonderful job. Really encourage you to, to join with us on Wednesday Worship. That will be on YouTube and on our Facebook and on our GrimsbyBaptistChurch.co.uk website. While we're on the subject of the website, again, just a reminder, we have this mailing list where we'd like to keep in touch with you, let you know what's happening in the life of the church during lockdown and afterwards. So please, if you do have an email address, uh, go across to the website, enter your details, and we will just keep you in touch with notices and let you know what's happening. One of the things that we're really excited to, to let you be aware of is that the first Sunday of each month, we will be holding communion as part of our online service. To enable this, we would invite you to get the elements yourself, prepare them and have them ready for the service when you come to watch it on the Sunday morning. And then during the service, we will have our normal segments where we pray and we pray over the bread and we pray over the wine and we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. OK, we can't be together. We can't take communion in one building or with friends and family, but we are still part of the body of Christ. And as such, we are still meeting together and we should do this in remembrance of him. So please, if you feel comfortable doing it, please be prepared for the first Sunday of every month to take communion with us. We we'll really hope that you will be with us and will uh, enjoy having a bit of normal life in these really strange and abnormal times. So now we're just going to come together. We're going to come under the, the word and start our our service. Um, I was reading Philippians and it's probably the most joyous book in the Bible. Uh, over and over again, Paul mentions joy and rejoice. And he says to rejoice in the Lord always. And I think at these times, this is really something for us to hold on to. Paul is writing this joyous book of God and his love and rejoicing. And he's in a dark, dingy Roman prison. So rejoicing and praising God is about transcending where we are. It's about not being trapped by the circumstances of this present age, but rejoicing, not because of them, but through them, because God is sovereign, God is in control, and we have the hope of glory in ourselves. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we have this opportunity to meet, that we can come under your word, that even in these dark days, you are the light shining in the darkness. Lord, guide us today. Let us come before you with worshipful hearts and let through your Holy Spirit, your words minister to us. Illuminate your word and let us love you more. For your glory. Amen. So we're going to start now and I would encourage you to come and join us, even if you're in the house, um, in worship. We'll be singing, praise him, you heavens. So we're going to move across now to the worship team who will lead us in worship. And I do really encourage you, even if you're at home, God can still hear you. And unfortunately for my family, they can hear me sing too. and heavenly host let the whole earth praise him praise him the sun moon and bright shining stars praise him you heavens and waters and skies let the whole earth praise him great in power great in glory Yeah. 
Praise Him, you heavens and all that's above. Praise Him, you angels and heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and skies. Let the whole earth praise Him. Great in power, great in glory, great in mercy, King of heaven. Great in battle, great in wonder, great in Zion, King over all the earth. Great in power, great in glory, great in mercy, King of heaven. Great in battle, great in wonder, great in Zion, King over all the earth.
But I do need some help. I need an assistant. So, well, the only person who's here is my wife, Ruth. Now, Ruth, I'm going to teach you a trick, if that's okay, yeah? Um, so, this trick is called the famous handkerchief trick, alright? So, first of all, I need you to pick a hanky, but I'll be a nice husband and let you pick whichever one you want, but not that one, alright? That one is my favourite, alright? You take the green one, I'll take the blue one. And what we need to do is do this. Go. I'm about to perform! I'm about to. The famous! The famous. That's it, real nice and energetic. That's mm. it, I like it. Trick! Trick. Lovely. Um, we'll, we'll move on. Um, so, what we do, we take the hanky like this, and then we take our left hand like this, in a nice fist, and we just stuff the hanky into our hands like this, as best as we can like that. Okay, so we can't see it no more. And then all we need to do is go like this. <sighs> Blow. And then show your hands completely empty like that. Hasn't worked, has it, that one for you? Um, it's alright, because you see, mine hasn't actually worked, because mine's just hiding inside this other hand over here, like that right there. But I bet you want the blue one now, don't you? I bet you want the blue one. I thought you would. You take that one, then I'll take the green one. Okay, so we're going to try again. All right? That's it. Look really energetic and re really enthusiastic. I like it. I like it. Okay. So we take our left hands like this. And we stuff, 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 stuff. Stuff, 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 stuff. Okay. Now, Ruth. Mm -hmm. Has it gone yet? No. It's alright. I know why. We haven't done the blow yet. <sighs> blow. And then show your hands completely empty like that. Not quite getting the angle, this, are you? It's okay. Um, you see, the thing is, this is, this is a little bit like us trying to, well, make other things vanish, make our sins vanish. The bad things that we do disappear. Well, the trouble with that is we can't do that. All we can do is, well, we can, we can hide them and we can make them not be as visible. But the trouble is, all we do is we just end up hiding them inside of other sins. To actually remove our sins, we need this. That's mine. You ate yours. Alright. A lamb. You see, this lamb, well, this lamb is going to be a sacrifice for our sins. First, my table, and now my chocolate lamb. You see, when Jesus died on that cross, he was known as the Lamb of God. Because, well, when he died on that cross, he became a sacrifice for us, for our sins, when he bled and died. But the great news is that, obviously, we know he, now that he rose again, three days later. So then, when we take our sins, and then when we take Jesus, and we say, Jesus, I want you to be a part of my life. I want you to be my sacrifice for my sins. I want you to be my saviour. 
and we realise that he is the Lamb of God. When we take that decision and let Jesus into our lives, we gain new life in the form of an egg. Now, the great thing about this is, once we know this fact, once we know we have new life, and we can behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of this world, we can then go tell everybody about it. We can tell everyone about the great news of Jesus. To our Lord alone belongs the highest praise. Wherever we are, let's join in worship together. Who, O oh Lord, could save themselves? Their own soul could heal. Our shame was deeper than see your grace is deeper still who oh lord could save themselves their own soul could heal a shame was deeper than the sea Grace is deeper still. You alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death. So you alone belongs the highest praise. I 
gladly bow the knee and worship you, Lord. Forever you will be the Lamb upon the throne. I gladly bow the Worship you, Lord. Forever you will be. Forever you will be. The Lamb upon the throne. The Lamb upon the throne. I gladly bow the knee. I gladly bow the knee. And worship you. A big thank you there to the to the worship team. Let us now continue our worship as we move into a time of prayer. Father God, we thank you that you are sovereign, that you are in control, that you have always been in control. Lord, we think of those that are afflicted through this virus, those that are ill, and the families around these people that are ill, dying and have died, but also those that are feeling the effects of this virus through the lockdown, through being isolated or, or trapped in abusive households. Lord, we lift up these people to you. We ask that you will bring the peace to them and that through this they will come to know you or have a deeper relationship with you. Lord, let us be the light in the darkness, the salt. Lord, let this operate for your glory. Father, we think of our leaders and the scientists and the medics. We thank you for the wonderful work that they've done so far. And ask that you'd continue to guide them and give them wisdom and discernment over the coming days. We pray for peace in this country as people get unsettled and anxious over the lockdown. Lord, let people see it's for the good of our communities for our people lord we also do ask on the flip that the powers that be don't abuse this time don't abuse the authority and the goodwill that the people have given them Lord, we think of those in our church family who are sick and are ill and we ask that you be with them that you bring peace and comfort to them and in your divine power lord we pray that you heal them those that are both physically and mentally sick Lord be with them at this time we look to the wider church Lord and we ask that your gospel work still continues through lowered neighbors through discipleship and friendship and online messages that are going out across the world today Lord let new people see you and hear of you open hearts and minds to your son and his wonderful sacrifice lord we thank you for what you are doing and what you will do and we look to that day when we can be with you in glory amen our reading is from john chapter 1 verses 19 to 34 and this is the testimony of john when the jews sent priests and levites from jerusalem to ask him who are you he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, 
but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit, we long to. We are continuing our series in John and to bring us the word today uh, really pleased to introduce you to one of our own it's not the Liverpool legend it's the Grimsby legend Stephen Gerrard well good morning I trust you're all holding up well uh, during this uh, difficult time I'm sure we're all really looking forward to the time that we all can meet together and have fellowship together uh, once again 
This is the, the second message in our series on the Gospel of John. Eric last week uh, took us through the first 18 verses, the word becoming flesh in Jesus Christ and incredibly dwelling amongst men. Of course, during his sermon, we were also introduced to John the Baptist. And it's his testimony this morning that I want us to pick up uh, as we go through these verses from 19 uh, to 34. Just to remind you that John was born of Zechariah the priest and his wife Elizabeth, but it's been spoken of for centuries before by the prophets and of course by the angel Gabriel, who had promised Zechariah in the temple a son in his old age. So shocking, of course, was that news to Zechariah that like Sarah in the Old Testament, he didn't fully believe it and he was struck dumb until the baby was born. Also last week, we learned that from the passage that, that John was a man sent from God. He had come as a witness to the light, namely Jesus Christ, the light of the world. He cried out regarding Jesus. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Verse 15. I've always loved the story of John the Baptist. He's like a first century, much better version of the modern day Bear Grylls. Living alone in caves and surviving off the land, those tasty locusts and the, the delicious wild honey. I can relate to, to it a bit having eaten insects out in Africa and in New Guinea, moon bugs with a bit of garlic. And they actually taste pretty good. But by doing this, by becoming this person living in the wilderness, he was untainted by the world and the ungodly culture of his time. John was unaffected by uh, the current fashions. You may have noticed I'm wearing a camel colored shirt today and it's made of a soft cotton. Well, what was John wearing? Well, he was wearing a tunic of coarse camel's hair. And I'm afraid it would have been a lot more uncomfortable. It would have been the type of thing that only the most poor would have worn in his day, just tied up uh, with a leather belt. I don't think that would have been the latest trend, would you? He was unsullied by the vices uh, that had been adopted by so many who claimed to be religious in his day. The priesthood, the Pharisees, the scribes, all were living as utter hypocrites. Only a few uh, were not, uh, were living as God would have them. John's life was but a simple one, yes, but he was no fool. No deadbeat hippie, despite the length of his hair as a Nazarite. His cook vow as a Nazarite, of course, meant that he didn't touch alcohol. He was sober minded. He did not want to let the stuff of this world get in the way of devotion to God. Which, of course, is so often the case with us as modern day Christians, isn't it? Though he was poor, nothing but a vagabond. He had been educated by his learned father, Zechariah, the godly priest, and of course, his mother, Elizabeth. He would have known the scriptures inside out, the prophecies regarding his own destiny. They must have always been upon his mind as he grew up from boy to man. Zechariah says of his son, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Luke goes on to say in verse 80, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. So we see his education continued as he lived alone in the mountains and valleys, surrounded by the wilderness of the Galilee region, alone with his God, learning from creation about the creator, in prayer, in undistracted relationship with the one whom he loved. He knew his time would come. And in this chapter, we see John begin to fulfill the prophecies about him. He was to be the messenger, 
the voice, the witness, the one who would point people to the light, the Christ, the Lamb, the promised Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. I love John's story also because it's not actually about him, but about Christ. It's not about his success, not about his great abilities, his fame or his fortune. It was not about all of those things that make up the average modern biography. John had but one purpose in life, prepare. Prepare for the promised saviour of the world. His short life was never going to be about himself. It was only to point to and bring glory to the promised one. John arrives on the scene, as we heard last week, after some 400 years of silence. Isaiah had prophesied that he would be coming. Israel, at this time under Herod the Tetrarch, was in a desperate place, spiritually desolate, a corrupt priesthood, only a few remain faithful, just a remnant. This was truly the Dark Ages, a bleak period for Israel. Now was the time. Now was the time for the voice, the cry into the wilderness of man's ex human experience. The darkness of night was at an end. The morning star had appeared to usher in a new day. We read in the other gospels that we find no mention here. John's message and baptism was one of repentance. That complete turnaround, the TLV in military terms, that complete circular movement in order to face the other way from our sin unto a holy God, repentance. But here for the sake of time, I just want for us to touch on four things that John says. Four statements that again remind us that it was all about Christ, not about himself. He would actually later say in John chapter 3, verse 30, he must become greater, I must become less. So the first statement that I read here in verse 23 is, make straight the way of the Lord. The priests and the Levites were desperate to know exactly who John was. Who was this country vagabond who was creating such a stir, attracting the crowds, teaching uh, them this message of repentance? Why were so many people flocking to him? What was going on? Are you the Christ? Are you the Elijah? The way he dressed might have put them on that trail. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8 says that Elijah was known to have worn a very similar outfit. And of course, they should have known about the prophecies of Isaiah and Malachi, that Elijah would come. They continue on. Are you the prophet? These would have been huge claims, but he gives them an emphatic no. I am not the Christ. I am not Elijah. I am not the prophet. Yes, he had come in the spirit and power of Elijah, Luke 1 verse 17 tells us, but he was not him. In his humility, he says he is nothing but a voice crying out on behalf of another. It's amazing how Christ himself speaks of John in Matthew 11, verse 11. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Of course, only Jesus could say that, not John himself. No, John simply quotes Isaiah, the prophet, and cries, make straight the way of the Lord. Note not John the Baptist's way, but the way of the Lord. Get ready, repent, the Lord is coming, was his message. Uh, we cannot be sure if these priests and Levites would have been up on their scriptures or not, as they, they should have been. Again, this is a time of spiritual depression and compromise. Hypocrisy was absolutely rife. We see that uh, John actually refers to them in Matthew 3, 7 as a brood of vipers. Perhaps, but perhaps they did know. And if so, the scripture John was referring to is found in Isaiah 40, verse 3. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. I don't know if you like the Handel's Messiah. I really love it. 
And those words are sung so beautifully, uh, wonderfully in, in that piece of music. They should have understood this to being a voice that preceded the coming and the comfort of the Messiah. That's what John wanted them to understand as he quoted, I am but a voice, a cry, a faint tremor before the earthquake arrival of the Christ. These priests and Levites keep on pushing John to state who he was, but John only wants them to know why he was. He must become greater, I must become less, is what he says later on. And that leads us nicely to our second statement. The sandal, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie, verse 27. There is a sense in which John the Baptist was like the town crier of old. Oh, yay! Oh, yay! Oh, yay! The king is coming! Make way! Make way! But it was never about the town crier, was it? It was always about the king. That was John. He counted himself utterly unworthy of the one who was coming. He had refused the titles that others were ready to give him. He was a just a voice, a baptizer, yes, but even then only with the ordinary water, not of the Holy Spirit, like the Christ who was coming. John counted himself not even worthy to bend down and untie the Messiah's shoelace. That's humility. The kind of humility that we see in Isaiah as he's confronted with that wonderful uh, vision in Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This is what, what Isaiah was experiencing. And what does he, how does he react? He says, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Woe is me cries out Isaiah, and that is John the Baptist, as he considers this coming Messiah, I am not worthy. John recognises his role, it's important, but he is only preparing the way for the very Son of God, the, the second person of the Trinity, the utterly holy, sinless creator God. Who is worthy of such a person? He might well echo Isaiah, woe is me. And we all should, shouldn't we? Twice John tells us, verses 16 and 30, he ranks before me because he was before me. The eternal aspect of the Messiah emphasised. He knew exactly who Jesus was. He had co-created the universe, existing in unity with the Father and Spirit from before the dawn of time. How great is our Lord Jesus Christ? When John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest of all, is unable to even untie his sandals. Do you know who this Jesus is? Are you humbled by the realization that he is God? Both James 4.10 and 1 Peter 5.6, we are told, humble yourselves before the Lord. James also tells us God resists the proud. And that's so difficult, isn't it, for us as human beings? We are so proud, so self-sufficient, so in control, so full of pride. There is no surprise when we hear the most popular funeral song is Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. Lyrics that are so full of I and me, what I have done and what I have achieved. What irony as the casket containing the lifeless body sits before the gathered congregation. A life lived for what? For me, myself and I? All our righteousness is as filthy rags, we are told. That which has been built up in this life will only burn. We can't take anything with us and that includes our pride. We have all sinned and fallen short of his glory, yet we will not humble ourselves, will we? 
We will not be as John and recognise we are utterly unworthy, deserving only death and eternal punishment. When we come face to face with Christ, as John did, and the Bible tells us all of us will sooner or later, it'll either be in this life or the next, we will all bow the knee and face the King. For at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Will you be humbled now or when it's too late? Will you make your life count for Christ? The great missionary to China, India and Africa, C.T. Studd, gave his life to the Lord and he understood this and he uttered these famous words, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. How we must come and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. He is worthy. Let us bow before him and offer him our lives. I did it my way. We'll never stand up as a defence before God as our final judge. John says, I am not even worthy enough to untie his sandal strap. And so we must move on to verse 29. And we see Jesus making his way towards John. As, as he does so, we read one of the greatest, perhaps even the greatest pronouncements of all time falls from his lips. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away uh, the sin of the world. John, the voice in the wilderness, explains exactly who Jesus is. The Lamb, behold him. That is where we are to press the rewind button of Scripture. Our minds are to head back, to be pulled back into uh, the Old Testament. The Lamb, what great significance. It was the lamb whose blood would be shed and placed on the doorposts and lintels of every Hebrew household during the final devastating plague in Egypt. So that the angel of death would pass by and the firstborn would live. Still remembered and celebrated as a feast still to this day as the Passover uh, by Jews all over the world. Then, of course, every day, both morning and night in the temple, we read in Exodus, a lamb was to be slaughtered. Why? It was slaughtered as a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And who can forget those powerful prophetic words of Isaiah hundreds of years before the Messiah, the Christ, ever came to earth? Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb to, that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Behold the Lamb of God, says John. The Lamb God ordained, his gift to mankind. The Lamb was always associated with sacrifice and Jesus as the Lamb of God would be no exception. Paul refers to him as our sacrificial Passover lamb, 1 Corinthians 3, 7. And John the Baptist tells us exactly for whom that sacrifice would be made. He says this lamb would take away the sin of the world. I like what the commentator Alexander McLaren says here. The sin of the world, as if the whole mass of human transgression was bound together in one black and awful bundle and laid upon the unshrinking shoulders of this better Atlas who can bear it all and bear it all away. Your sin and mine and every man's, they were all laid upon Jesus Christ. A better atlas, of course, refers to Greek mythology and the, the Titan who, who was condemned to bear the weight of the world upon his shoulders. You may have seen the, the statues, I'm sure, but the, the, the Lamb of God doesn't just bear it. He takes away the sin of the world. These are uncertain days. We've all been affected by this COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Many of us will know people who have been ill or even died from this virus. Maybe we are fearful for ourselves, our families. Perhaps all of us are considering at this time 
more than ever our mortality. The Bible tells us there is but one hope, and that is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you truly believe that Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, took away your sin? Do you recognize your own guilt before a holy God and that this lamb took your punishment as a sacrifice for you upon that cross? Turn away from your sinful life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved from the wrath to come. Freedom from sin, a new hope, eternal life, a friend that sticks closer than a brother throughout all this time of social distancing can be yours because of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we move to our final statement. As Jesus Christ is baptised by John, did Christ need John's baptism of repentance? Of course not. He was without sin. His life had been perfectly lived out from childhood. He was the pure, unspotted lamb, his fleece whiter than the snow. So why did he get baptised despite John's objections that we read of in Matthew chapter 3, verse 14? It says there that John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptised by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness. Jesus was, of course, in a sense, authenticating, giving the rubber stamp to John the Baptist in his ministry. God has commanded through John the pe that people should be baptised. And Jesus was doing this in obedience to the Father rather than John. It's illustrated to all the, the perfect harmony that is to be found between the forerunner John's ministry that was coming to an end with Jesus Christ's ministry that was only just beginning. Let's read these verses in, in verses 30 to 34 again, uh, just to remind us uh, again of what it says. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptise with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptises with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. John, John does not say anything here of the bapti physical baptism. But the other Gospels do bear witness of this. It says there in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, And when Jesus was baptised, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Jesus was taken down into the waters and brought back up, just as we do with baptism today. John witnesses the most incredible sight at this point. The Spirit of God descending like a dove. He hears the voice of God declaring, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. We read that in Mark's Gospel. So fourthly, John himself declares, I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is the Son of God. We have seen all three members of the triune God so far spoken of in this incredible first chapter of John. They're all here within the baptism of Christ. Jesus Christ, we saw last week, was the eternal word who was at work with the Father in the creation of this great universe. We saw he was the true light, the, tr the, 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 the word and the true light. John tells us he took flesh and became a human being so that man could see the glory of God through the Son, full of grace and truth, verse 14. Jesus was the Son of God, the Son from the Father. There are plenty of cults and religions that would seek to undermine Jesus being God arguing there is but one God, but of course we believe too that there is one God. One God in three persons. The Trinity, of course, is incredibly difficult to get our heads around, but we could spend 
weeks and weeks studying it, but of course we have no time this morning. As Christians, we simply believe by faith in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three in one. They are all spoken of here. John the Baptist bore witness that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Friends, in closing, I just tr want to trust that you too are declaring that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. No, we were not present at his baptism, but we have borne witness of him through the word. We have experienced his great salvation. We have a great opportunity to bear witness at this time. Yes, I know with social distancing, the two meter rule, we can barely get close to each other. We, we might not even be able to leave our homes. Yet people are fearful. People are wondering. People want answers. And we still have ways of getting the message out. If you are watching this service right now, you most certainly are on the internet. Can we not bear witness to the Son of God through Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, Twitter, or even Zoom that we're just getting used to as a church? Social networking is vital at the moment, but no more so than for us to get the gospel message out to those who are fallen and fearful. Perhaps a text or an old fashioned phone call is what's needed. If you are not so up with technology, a card, a handwritten letter, people need to hear from us more than ever. Can we testify to the Son of God through our actions, those of us who can still get out a bit, helping those in need, buying shopping, picking up medicines, giving of our time, our money, yet never forgetting to speak of the reason we do what we do. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the hope that is within us. I'm sure many of you are doing this already. What are we here for as Christians? if not to bear witness of the Son of God. John the Baptist lived his short but fruitful life only to point people to the Christ. His sole purpose in life was to lead people to the Lamb of God, the Son of God. He was the voice crying out in the wilderness. Our worship group are now going to lead us in our final song before the throne of God above. You can almost hear John the Baptist singing it, can't you? Verse three, listen. Behold in there the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ 
raised on high with Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and Our service is drawing to a close now. So just to remind you that we have worship on Wednesday, which will be on our Facebook page and on YouTube. And next Sunday, we're back here again at grimsbybaptistchurch.co.uk with our online service and also on YouTube. So just to leave you with that benediction that will be familiar from so many of us. It's from 2 Corinthians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Stay safe, have a good week, God bless.